Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of EA Global Summit 2022. This is Nabil from the EA Global Summit organizing team. Thanks everyone uh, for joining us and for your interest for this session. The session will be presented by Peter Lieber. Peter is an enterprise architect expert, plays role of a president at Association of Austrian Software Innovation and leading innovations at Spark System Central Europe and Lieber Lieber Software. Today, Peter is presenting about model maturity integration uh, which is an extension of capability maturity model integration uh, so before we start the presentation uh, you know let me explain how the participants can interact with uh, Peter uh, since uh, the participants are muted throughout the session if you have any questions during the session uh, you can use the chat window uh, to drop your questions to the speaker and uh, we will be reading out the questions and the speaker will answer uh, during the uh, Q&A session at the end uh, to enable collaboration and communication uh, with Peter uh, directly after the session, we request you to visit the channel, team, uh, Teams channel, and uh, I'll be sharing the link in the chat. And if you have any, you know, any question, I mean, any difficulties in accessing the Teams channel, uh, please reach us uh, via registrations at eaglobalsummit.com. I'll also paste the email in the chat. So thanks uh, once again for your interest and support uh, to the EA Global Summit 2022. Uh, looking forward to the wonderful session with Peter. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Have a nice evening, night if it's in Australia or lunchtime in the US, I think, something like that. Um, I'm going to talk about today about um, the model maturity model integration. And as I'm really for more than 30 years in business and started as a developer, I was always afraid about uh, CMMI and stuff. But as time goes by and on and I'm getting older and more responsible for stuff and models and also for bigger customers, um, there is a new uh, way in my head of thinking how to keep that maturity level or reach a higher maturity level as typically you have in your organization maybe. So it is not only about to create valuable models, it, it, it's also about creating indispensable models. And the model maturity model, and it's a kind of a tank breaker because model is two times here, maybe we find a better uh, word later and it's just a working title, uh, but it's all about how to increase the value of your models in your organizations and not only for a one-time effect, but for a longer journey. Here, a short introduction of mine because I did not make the video run and I don't did not want to, to restart the, the camera uh, just right before the session. Uh, but if you don't have seen me so far, I'm looking like this. You can find me also in the in LinkedIn and everywhere. Um, my current position is I'm the CEO of Liba Lieb of Spark Systems Central Europe. There, I focus on enterprise architect, pro cloud server, and Prolabrate, focusing on licensed sales. And uh, I also started to become a CEO for Spark Services. Um, and here we have a little focus on enterprise architecture management. We have a special landing page for it uh, based on the Spark ecosystem. So um, it's not only about selling tools anymore only, but also to help organizations to get it into run, to combine it with existing technologies, to provide some support around the product. Um, and uh, we learned already it's not that easy because a lot of different organizations are different and uh, it's not easy to understand everybody's other's business. So we are really focusing on that, what we can provide with tools and the ecosystem. And uh, very often we are cooperating with other consulting companies um, to, to get it into run in your organization. Um, after Corona, during Corona, um, I became Austrian Entrepreneurs Association president. This is the oldest organization in Austria uh, related to entrepreneurs, meaning since 1839 or something like that. If you are familiar with history, um, there was a Kaiser in Austria and first Metternich, and he changed almost Europe that time after Napoleon Wars. And then this was, uh, was founded. And I'm really proud to lead that organization at the moment with more than 3,000 uh, companies uh, integrated. And this makes definitely sense because I'm really um focused on EAM since some years. Uh, maybe a little outlook for the next year. Uh, there will be a renaissance of model-based systems engineering also from the perspective of Spark services. And so uh, next year we will come up with some model-based systems engineering uh, again, uh, also from the services side. 
in Spark Systems, there's all there. Uh, you know, AD modeling languages and stuff and everything around. But from the services perspective, we will have uh, to give it another domain. And you know, that's very different. And this is also very special to enterprise architecture. You have different domains, different languages for all domains, and also different competitors. And this is a part of the fun story uh, to cooperate and to be part of the Sparks uh, story of success. My personal belief is um, that innovation needs models. So it's not all about documentation. So I, I think documentation is worth and uh, also model uh, models are able to generate documents, um, very often static documents from the past, but uh, nowadays it's more live documents. But I really believe on this innovation aspect of models. And as innovation means it's new, it's not in the market, but it has to go to the market because innovation is only innovation if it reaches the market. Then I really trust that innovation needs models that people that are not able to understand are getting open ears and eyes and understand what's behind. But models, and you know, even the term is challenging. We are currently in an artificial intelligence uh, project. It's a, it's, a, it's a research project with Infineon and others and Monteo around ecological motor drive systems for electronic vehicles um, uh, to optimize that and to make it more energy efficient and so on. But models is a term uh, that is used very often. You have, uh, of course, in the real world, you have models that are nice people, um, or you have models for with what we have in mind, it's UML, it's SysML, it's BPMNs so or such kind of models. And of course, there are AI models. So there's different, the same terms and same terminology, but totally different meanings. So it's very important if you want to drive innovation to make clear which, which kind of models you mean and, uh, and how you interact with the terms and terminology. And their enterprise architect is a real day-to-day -day helper and you will see how to make it even better. So the challenges, um, so to go a little bit around the, the, the agenda, I will address the challenges. Who has been at the session from Horst yesterday, we'll have seen it already, but I think it, it can't be repeated uh, enough. Then how to become successful as a general aspect, then which are the five A that you need, and then we come into the model, maturity model, and I will do some live stuff, Please do not over expect that. Do really classical things, but I do live modeling um, uh, because I just want to describe the architecture or the, 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 the how, how enterprise architect is, is and its ecosystem is um, built up and why there are uh, nowadays more challenges than in the past to get this thing also in place. And uh, Nissan is doing a, a great job or ProLabor is doing a great job to make it easier again. But uh, yes, if you want to uh, reach the world and not only the neighbor, it's, uh, it's more than just one, one screw you have to, to tackle. So the challenges. The challenges in the past, we thought everything can be solved by a tool. So tool is one aspect, but in reality, it's also about the language. And with language, in this case, I mean UML, SysML, Akimate, uh, BPMN, Babok as a, as, an, as a variant of a language, uh, wireframing, risk taxonomies, uh, threat modeling, and so on and so forth. So languages, so you have to understand the language and to make proper models and not only to create boxes and lines and drawings. This is also a challenge itself that there's a difference between making nice diagrams and to create models. Um, but um, this is a, an aspect. Then kind of a methodology. Is it really part of a V model and you have a design up front and you have a test model at the end, or you have a more agile approach to, to deal with the modeling aspects? How do you collaborate together? Um, and also here, Enterprise Architect provides a lot of possibilities and to combine every possibility is not that clever. You have to find the way how you want to collaborate and then find out which support you get from, from the tools and then tackle it and find out, okay, this is the way you want to go. And of course, you need some experience. I see here in the list uh, of participants, the minimum 10 persons I know in person who are experts in enterprise architect already and have also made their experience in their ecosystems with their project. And hopefully they are still open-minded 
uh, to think about new new aspects or new tryouts, how to cooperate in the future based on enterprise architect ecosystem. Because just to let you know, um, and this is maybe a clear session, a clear message, a fool with a tool is just a fool. And the second, a genius without a tool is not productive. Have a genius in mind using Flipchart to model stuff. Um, yes, it's maybe great what he is modeling, but you cannot share or make a picture of it. And then you have no model who looks at the picture and it has no meaning. So we need, um, we need to tackle that as well. Um, and what we have learned in the, it's, it's not very popular to talk about failure. Um, and a lot of people think, hey, to talk about fuck ups or failure is not very proper. And hey, show us the heroes and show us the people that succeeded and have been very successful. And I'm starting a session and say how we can fail with our modeling approach. And because we have seen quite a lot of things uh, over the years, and it is true that people also leave us because of uh, complexity, misunderstanding, but luckily, some of them are coming back and we are always growing. So we have more people coming to us and say, hey, great what you're doing. And I think um, it could be even greater if you have in mind uh, how not to fail because others have failed and you can learn of these mistakes and errors. And therefore, I always bring also this presentation also for new customers and they're always very impressed. So if you see the benefit of modeling and over time, and you have just this first approach, this first approach could end up in a mess. Yeah? So everything is connected with everything because somebody said you have to have this connectivity. It's very intuitive to make that, but you are lost in complexity over time. You are maybe alone and, uh, and to share that is nearly impossible. So you typically fail with that uh, do whatever you want approach. A second approach could be that you define a, a, a target and but it is too complex because you try to use a lot of features and capabilities but your team is not ready the experience experience is not there and you have not enough support meaning from spark services as an example or from our partners uh, that ha give, can give you a hand and then you will always fail and say very often people say the tool is crap hey but it's not true it's all the, it's the mixture uh, of the things that are uh, bringing to this uh, complexity you can get a lot of complexity out of enterprise architect um, if you configure it correctly and so on and so forth. So and if you have this in mind, language method, experience and tool, then you can may come to a strategic aim where you want to go. And this is even higher. You want to have raised big benefits and the time should be not there. It should be a kind of the middle term. And then it could be an approach that you go to a huge, the top five consultancy companies say, hey, hey, go on, make my make my enterprise architecture ready for my 800 applications I have in my organization. And these excellent consultants are rushing you with hundreds of people, make a perfect enterprise architecture. But at the specific point in time, you find out, oh my goodness, this is far too complex. I will not get it in my organization. And what happens, it fails totally. It costs a lot of money. The benefit was almost there, uh, but if you try to get in the organization, you failed. So because you try to make all at once with a big step, with a big bang, and I think modeling, and this is a thing what we have learned, modeling was never a hype, maybe at the very beginning, but the, the, the audience was very small, but compared to other technologies in the market or other strategies in the market, modeling was never a hype, but it was always there and it was always increasing and always a growing market. And there is competition, what means, hey, there is a market uh, that is far bigger than we know uh, as we are only in our domain. So what we, would be a more clever approach is to find a step that is a useful one. It could be generating documentation. It could be finding a nice add-in to Enterprise Architect. And I'm, I'm a friend of add-ins for Enterprise Architect, uh, like a document generation from EA Docs that is a helper uh, for, for stuff. Or you use the document generation feature in, built in an enterprise architect to generate worth documents uh, that are not, uh, that have not to be manipulated. Could be a very first step. Then you stay on that level at time to find out, hey, is it good for me? Is it good for the others? And then you can go to the next step and so on and so forth. And so you have a more iterative approach onwards. So it's typically not three steps. It's just a, a symbolization of what you can achieve over time. 
And this is very important to have in mind. So once again, I repeat it almost since three or four years already. This is and it, it, it improves already. It's, it, it's already improved. There's no the lines here, uh, but it's very important to have this in mind. There is a, a, a lot of possibilities to fail, um, and I think it's very clever to think to think to think in big wins, in short wins, and so on, and then uh, to share the launch with the people. What you need, um, and this is also very underestimated, you need, of course, I, I try to find five A's just to make it like a consultant. <laughs> I've learned from the consultants. Um, yes, you have to need you need awareness from the management. Enterprise architect makes the starting point very easy. We see that later. So get an enterprise architect, install enterprise architect. It's a long um, story of success that you can get enterprise architect very easy. Uh, you can just download the trial version even with not without registering, um, and uh, and then you need to get with your work what you do with enterprise architect. You need the awareness, otherwise it will not grow in the organization. You need attention. You need to have time with it. You have to be uh, with your models and uh, as a daily, more or less daily buddy. You need architects, architecture, and last but not least, architecture management. And now, if you go to the maturity model, I was really reading about the CMMI. I think 30 years of 25 years ago, a guy from Siemens uh, in the railway industry said, "Hey, Peter, you have to go to, through that. You are a software." guy you have to fulfill maturity level and so on and so forth and the own i think the only organizations i know um that have reached cmmi level four or five is are placed in india because it's sorry they are very structured very concrete and thank you for hosting this event and showing how structured you are uh, but in europe it was more uh, hey i'm level one i'm great i have a, i have something or nothing is it's initial i have no defined process. I just develop, and uh, and the second one is managed to have. Uh, oh, we have a plan. What we are doing, and then it's going to define and so on and so forth. But for models, there was nothing. It was for product and service development. There was a special edition of for development. For service, it was for service. There's also a CMI for services, and for uh, again for product service acquisition. Uh, this kind of a nightmare that we have all to deal with is that the acquisition process for software is also well defined but where is cmmi for architecture where is cmi for model-based architecture so there is nothing and because i don't want to touch uh the the, the the wording and pronunciation i just named it model maturity model integration uh, related to capability model maturity capability maturity model integration what is the categorics by the cmmi so first is the level one initial, you do what you want. It's the, the developer hero, uh, he knows everything, he does everything, um, and you can compare it a little bit to the modeling hero. Um, then the next step is processes characterized for projects is often reactive. Okay, there is an issue, I react, but I have no plan. I just, oh, there we need to have a process, then we define the process because we have to define it. Later on, you have an active management of a process and it's proactive, so you have to, um, to leave it. Um, their developers also run away from organizations. Oh my God, now it's so restricted. And then we come for, to a level four and level five, it's uh, optimizing already. But again, what does it mean in the context of models, in the context of enterprise architect models, of course, in my world? So I have a bit, little bit reframed that say, okay, level one, two, three, four. And what does it mean in the day to day life? And if you start with enterprise architect, uh, a lot of people start to have to download Enterprise Architect. It's the start phase, it's the rep phase. And here we are really strong as Sparks. It is easy to get Enterprise Architect. It is easy to install. It is easy to run as long as you have uh, administrative rights. But we have now a zero installer. So even if you don't have administrative rights, you can copy the files and uh, the files of the installer to any directory you have. And even then you can start and work with Enterprise Architect. So just go and purchase a license, install EA, run EA. But the collaboration is me, myself and I, so we are free. <laughs> um, so I do it for me, I do it myself and I do it with me again. And so it's the collaboration point is here not interesting. The good thing is I can structure 
the, the models or the packages or the elements as I wish. I don't have to discuss with anybody if it's great or not, if it's clever or not. I do it as I feel it's right. Um, and that's also a very important approach. So you, you can start with enterprise architect without knowing too much about structuring. Um, and uh, But later on, it would be clever to, to have kind of a training to have, find a good structure. Uh, but hey, as a beginner, just do it. Yeah, and no, use what I want and need. And later, uh, the, the next low hanging fruit is, hey, I have created a great model. I have created big and valuable diagrams. And then I create documents, HTML, and I share maybe also parts of the model. In my personal life, I do this daily. Um, so I use it for any kind of ideas, any thoughts, for some private stuff like wedding planning. I do not marry too often, two times enough. Uh, for funeral planning, uh, so this is the, the bad side of my life that some people are dying already around me. But to make a plan of it, it's very really clever instead of writing emails and writing papers about how to plan a funeral. Um, the household organization, so even my kids are involved in enterprise architect because um, if the planning for, uh, no, not, not for the planning for the toilet is not a plan, uh, but the planning who is they making the household, who is taking care, what has to be done first, how to feed the animals. So that's all an enterprise architect in my world. So, and how is, how this is, um, how this is implemented in enterprise architect is the same. So the deployment model of enterprise architect itself, and this is what I'm going to build up right now. I just created a view of how to deploy enterprise architect. So Spark's ecosystem maybe is the, the right word. And I was thinking about, hey, take a, some modern aspect or do, take a, some classical aspect. And I decided, no, I will do a very traditional one. I just, uh, yes, that having two screens is sometimes challenging. I just use the simple deployment uh, diagram and I say, okay, this is my uh, single user deployment uh, scenario. And my single user deployment scenario, yes, I have a node and this node is some desktop or a notebook, whatever could be a MacBook. There is a, a great thing that you can run Enterprise Architect, even if it's a rich application um, on, on all platforms almost. Um, as, a, as a fun fact or real fact, um, development is done using Linux Mint. Uh, so there is no almost no Windows expect for testing, uh, I think, in Australia. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some more, but not for developers. And here we have a desktop. And the easy thing is we have one component. The component is called EA. Uh, also known as Enterprise Architect, because my son always thinks EA means EA Games and they do all the gaming, uh, but in my world it's Enterprise Architect. And what you do with Enterprise Architect, what I have done right now here, I have created a local repository and it is just an artifact. The artifact is a, nowadays, it's a QEX file, it's a recommend, my personal recommendation for local repositories um, if you use 64-bit. It's SQLite, it's fast, it's performant, and I really appreciate that new file format. And I make a very simple model. I use associations only. And if I'm clever, I can already, beside the drawing, I can also define multiplicity and say, okay, one enterprise architect, of course, one enterprise architect has minimum one, otherwise it's not clever, uh, repositories. So maybe we can we can name this because it is a database. Uh, it's always a database in enterprise architect world. We name it very often repository. And uh, a little bit challenging. There was in the past project browser, but still project is a name that is also here. Uh, so maybe we have another term for almost the same thing. And to make this somehow clear, you can also visualize that in the model. That's all. So starting enterprise architect is that easy um, as that scenario. You just install it or copy it. So it's even not that required to install it. Start modeling, just create a file, structure a package, make as you wish. I have already here some hierarchy um, and that's all. So that's the simple world. And this was, I think, before five years, that was our world, uh, nothing else. Maybe some input expert capabilities working together with others, yes. Um, but I stay with that because I want to go to the next approach. 
So that means if your modeling work was helpful for, for your organization, not for yourself, but for your organization, maybe uh, or hopefully your colleagues are also interested to start modeling. Of course, with Enterprise Architect, why they should look at another tool because you do great work and Enterprise was, Architect was helpful for you, why not for the others? And then we come to the next level of, collabor of, of uh, modeling. And then you are not alone anymore. Yeah, so um, again, it, the architecture is a little bit, fo the idea is a little bit focused on what you have already. In the past, maybe you can have here directly uh, a database, so meaning SQL Server, Oracle, or any other database. But nowadays, we really recommend to use ProCloud Server. And I will show you in a minute why um, a hybrid scenario makes also sense. Uh, but here um, I focus a little bit on that was our recommendation. And so if you start collaboration, you will have a ProCloud server in the middle. You will kind of have kind of a central repository. You will use ProCloud server. It's very clever because it's free of charge if you are only using Enterprise Architect. If you're just working partly on it, you can use floating licenses. The licenses are also provided by ProCloud server. Um, the protocol is also nice, it's HTTP, I recommend HTTPS of course, so you use HTTPS and if you want to use it as a key store server, you have to use HTTPS um, and so it's also nice to get to the database, you have, don't have to configure database access, you go using HTTPS. Uh, the only challenge you have is to find a common structure. You have to agree with your colleague, it's only one or if it's five, then it's easy to agree on a common approach. So you can't see my hands, but I'm moving with my hands and my face, but sorry, the camera is not working. Trust me. Um, I, I really try to be as near to you as possible without uh, that you can see me, but uh, yes. Uh, but you have to define your common structure. Uh, think about packages, think about diagrams, elements. You have already to start thinking as you're in a small team and you're all on the same table. This is not really a challenge, but if you are having colleagues in, Austria, India, Chicago, wherever on the world. And this happens during Corona very often. And that's also why Brooklyn server was dramatically increasing in salary because people identified, hey, a central database means that you need a, a big bandwidth to the database. And if the database connection is lost because at home people don't have good database connections, then they can go either to Citrix or any other desktop sharing environment or use ProCloud Server. But you have to think about collaboration challenges like locking, um, like uh, like visibility levels. So it's kind of a secret that there is also visibility levels. Um, it's not my personal favorite feature because, uh, because it's built into the database. It's a little bit hard to configure, it has some challenges, but it's already, it's worth thinking about it. Um, at least because in the lock mechanism for enterprise architect on root low, so for insiders, the model root is the very topmost element uh, in enterprise architect. On model root level, you can say hide for other groups. So there is a locking that allows to avoid that other can see another root node, uh, just to let you know. And visibility delivery gives a little bit deeper, but on database level, and you have to deal a little bit with more connectivity. So a little bit challenging feature. Uh, but it's also possible to define it. Some people have it. Um, the majority that are real open-minded modelers don't want to avoid duplicates. And with visibility levels, there is a good chance that you create a lot of duplicate things and therefore I don't like too much visibility levels. But some cases need that. You have maybe to think about activating EA security that you know who has done what somehow. You can activate audit if you really wish. And you have to can already start thinking about using Prolaborate with live access. So if you have a central repository, why not sharing also with the wider audience already here in this stage? Um, so what does it mean in enterprise architect uh, logic? So we can go for another diagram because as you know, the diagram, a diagram is just a few point. So we make this uh, multi-user, multi-user. And in the multi-user system, of course, we still have uh, the desktop. Um, we still have, of course, let's just uh, take Enterprise Architect. We still have Enterprise Architect, but we will have another node. And the other node is, um, I mentioned uh, ProCloud Server, I would name it Application Server. 
Um, this application server uh, has a component, and here I make it a little bit bigger because I have a plan with it already. Um, and there's this component is called ProCard server. Um, we shortcut it sometimes with PCS, so just ProCloud Server. In reality, um, it's named server and cloud. It must not be in the cloud. It must not be on a dedicated server. It is in reality a service. And uh, and uh, ProCloud Server means that you can run it in a cloud ecosystem, but you can run it also on-premise. So this is a, a service. Um, what this service has, uh, it has some interfaces. Also, again, for the pure modelers, please, sorry for making uh, shortcuts, but I just create now a, an element that okay, provides an interface. And the interface it's providing, it's, it's an HTTPS interface. And, um, and this is on port, by default, it's port 1805. Of course, you can switch it to 443. But this is uh, this is the default port, the default interface, and uh, enterprise architect again a simplification just uses that. So I must just use it. And um, and use uh, there is a protocol behind. Um, but just to let you know, this is a specific one. Um, if you want to know what's behind, I think it's called SSIP. Uh, there's a there's an extension SSIP. It just re hears on Spark's Cloud Link, I think. Uh, I have not the exact name, but uh, Spark's Cloud Link dot SSIP. So it's just identifying if there's driving having that one, if there are par parameters behind it, knows it's coming from Enterprise Architect. And uh, the ProCloud server uh, in that kind of usage is for free because it's for Enterprise Architect only. Um, what enterprise, uh, what the ProCloud server also provides, uh, maybe I go first to this artifact, meaning the licenses. Uh, so it holds these SS keys uh, files. So you can have um, this ProCloud server can be your new license server. Uh, again, I make it simple. Uh, this is a one-to-one -one relationship um, because there's only one SS key files, but there's a nice structure where you can define which kind of users have which license. So that's kind of, that's a that's a nice um, that's a nice capability and the old license server is deprecated. So if you are still using the old license server, I grab ProCloud server and activate HTTPS and and change it to, to ProCloud server and don't use the old one. Still there for traditional reasons, for um, but it's deprecated just to let you know. So, but where is the data? So the ProCloud server itself has no database but it has the same capability as Enterprise Architect. So of course you can have kind of a local database, but the recommendation is already to think a little bit bigger. And so you have some uh, database server. Um, and the database server, as you may know, um, can be more um, formats. So you can really choose which database format you want to have. In the Windows environment, it could be Microsoft SQL Server, uh, but it could be others yeah, like Oracle, uh, and I'm really proud that we are making it Oracle really performant again. Uh, hopefully, hopefully not everybody will switch to Oracle back, but um, that's a great news. Uh, MariaDB as an example, or uh, MySQL, or uh, Postgre, just samples, uh, Postgre, Postgres. Um, and these are real database servers, meaning that this is also a service having their own pros and cons. My personal recommendation, I like Microsoft SQL Server and MySQL MariaDB is almost the same base. Uh, that's my personal, personal favorites because I have the feeling that the way of how enterprise architect stores data and deals with data, that these, these two types is having not creating too much headaches. Uh, and then you have, again, uh, databases. Uh, so databases, this is one database as an example, and you can of course have more than one database um, and uh, and how it's how it's performed. The ProCloud server is having a configuration. It's called database managers, and then it's dealing, uh, doing the stuff going from enterprise architect to ProCloud server, and here is the relationship. Of course, I missed a thing that is in enterprise architect since ever. Uh, of course, it's possible that you have a direct connection from enterprise architect to the database. Um, this is important and you can use it in parallel. So this is kind of the old way. So it was allowed that enterprise architect, maybe if you go to the start page, you have cloud connection, server connection, URL connection, 
and uh, local files. Uh, the cloud is the ProCloud server. The server connection is a database. Um, so that's that's the truth. And here you had to configure on enterprise architect side. So you really can show it. Uh, if you go here and say server connection, you are this is new one. Our our um, our direct data uh, server connections. So it's not it's not uh, OLEDP automatically. So it's our new tr native drivers. Uh, but I think there is still there is still uh, the capability to say connect to server. And here we have this ODBC native connection, ODBC stuff. So native is pretty new. Uh, so we are trying to get rid of dependencies from Microsoft. So more or less. Um, and uh, here we have this direct database connection. So here we can use, let's say ODBC uh, or OLEDB or native drivers. Uh, but we have to configure it on the desktop. And if you ha have more users, every user must get this link. Of course, we have a nice feature that you can encrypt the connection so that you don't have to share the database users, uh, but you have direct access. And I think what is even more important, it's stateful. So if you make that kind of relationship, um, then you have to guarantee that the connection is not lost if you are working with the database. Otherwise, you will get connection lost. Really, please restart Enterprise Architect. Maybe you have seen that already, but you have a stateful connection, meaning do that only if you're nearby the server or have a LAN connection, um, just to let to let you know. This one uh, is in between the program server and the SQL server. It's exactly the same. So you can really copy that one. Uh, but uh, it is a server and the server, and it makes sense that these two servers are nearby. Yeah? Let me name it like that. Uh, but here, this relationship from enterprise architect to program service using HTTPS, what does it mean? It means it's stateless. What does it mean? What happens if you lose the connection? Enterprise architect will pop up a window and say, oh my goodness, I have lost the connection during the last transaction. And he tries, retries as long as ever, forever, he retries to rebuild the connection. Of course, if you are not then dropping or closing Enterprise Architect, of course, then the connection is lost. But if you keep it open and have the connection again because your mobile gets already connected, then you can go on working without restarting Enterprise Architect. So this is the benefit of having a stateless relationship. Um, again, my recommendation is, of course, that the application server, the database server, are almost near, as a meaning, the same machine or or the same cluster, but minimum in the same network segment. But you see already, uh, compared to single-user scenario, uh, multi-user is already a little bit more complex. And uh, just to say, okay, this is. This, the, the ProCloud service scenario is an alternative, of course, uh, because from a historical point of view, there was always a direct database connection. But here, uh, it makes definitely sense because of licensing, because of manageability, because you have to configure the database connections here on the ProCloud server. It, it is nice. And there are more benefits with ProCloud server. Uh, other benefits are, uh, and now we're going a little bit to commercial features. Uh, if we pro There's also another provided interface. I simplify it with uh, OSLC. There's an OSLC interface. Uh, it's a REST API because if you not have heard about it, it's called Open Service for Lifecycle. It's a REST full API using RDF. That's the only downside, but I don't think it's possible to do it a different way. Um, but uh, you have an open interface to ProCloud Server. And this open for interface to ProCloud Server allows, and remember my presentation, I said, it's possible already to think about in such scenario to use Prolaborate. And if you want to bring Prolaborate into the game, I will do it with another note. Of course, you can combine notes, but uh, to make it a little bit clear, there is a web server. So it sounds a little bit traditional what we are doing here. Uh, but uh, tradition is not always bad. It's, it's guarantee stability. IT will accept it. And there is another component. In this great component is called Prolaborate. And this Prolaborate uh, is using, as a matter of fact, this interface. Uh, only thing I can I can make a I can make a legend out of it. If you want to enable uh, OS, if you enable OSLC, you need a license for ProCloud Server. Another 
another interface um, is, so new trial demand provide another interface, is the so-called um, integrations. Um, I just, uh, just named it integrations here, where there is possibility to get data into enterprise architect. This is the main strategy is how to get data into enterprise architect to make references from your model to these foreign elements. And you can also write back something depending on the interfaces. Um, we have, uh, I just make a note or a, yes, I really make a note. I just take a note here um, and name some. Yeah, so it's uh, something like, name the funny ones, uh, Dropbox, yeah? how to get an element from a Dropbox or ServiceNow, how to get, if you have a well-structured ServiceNow, then you don't have to remodel all the PCs and network segments, you just can import that artifact. Or you have an Azure DevOps and you want to import uh, requirements or issues, or you have a Chira, or you have something that's called Doors NG. Uh, just to let you know, it's the new one. Um, what I've seen today was Polarion already. Uh, very new is Chama um, and so on and so forth. And self-written. And here again, we are coming as in a dimension. Uh, Sparks will not provide everything. It makes no sense because the, the entire world is millions of integrations. It's some. It's just sample implementations uh, or maybe uh, very often requested ones. Uh, but you can write your own, and there you get the source code, um, the source code in C Sharp or in C plus plus to write uh, such stuff. Um, just to let you know, and these are this is related somehow to this uh, interface. Um, then I have no right components. So with the commercial license, so below the line here, integration OSLC needs the commercial license of Procard Server, uh, but there's also a, an easy entry level, uh, but it has it brings power to the server. Um, you don't have to implement it on the enterprise architect. You can do it uh, headless. You mean you don't need an AP and, and, and front end for it. You can just uh, provide interface on the back end and that's provide in Procard Server provides the capability that enterprise architect gets access to someone else. A nice one, a nice one is also enterprise architect to enterprise architect, by the way. Uh, so you can use this integration also to make uh, relationships to other uh, repositories uh, hosted uh, by that are used by enterprise architect to get artifacts from other enterprise architects into your ecosystems by that. So it's uh, already, again, uh, compared to single user, I think we, you have to think about it, what makes sense in your organization. And um, yes, that's 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 the thing. Um, and now your modeling team is growing. You're not only three on the same place anymore or five, um, you're growing to 20, you're growing to 100 maybe, or I think the biggest installation we ever had was 10,000 models in one repository. Um, but uh, Normally, it's kind of between five and 20 in a team collaborating in one repository, up to 100 or something like that. But you have also people around modelers. So not only the people that know how to use Enterprise Architect, they're not afraid of uh, of using an interface. Uh, I have never touched the ribbons here. You, I just use the things. Uh, I did not care about Kanban and things, but people are getting off scared if they see too much good thing is an enterprise architect can customize it. But the good news is, um, hey, um, if you have people that just want to see that one, so not everything, not the entire ecosystem, they just want to see the result, again, they can get this documentation generated, but they can have a more live access like with Prolaborate. And so this is um, interesting. Or they just want to get lists, meaning a uh, uh, a list of security aware artifacts, a list of uh, a dashboard maybe, or they have to provide some input. Um, a good sample I always show with Prolabrate, it's not my session today, it's Prolabrate, but here you see a number of elements. If I go for that one, I see quite a lot of artifacts and attributes, but I don't want to provide everybody everything to contribute, but maybe the keywords. I say, okay, I want, hey, you, Guy, please provide me the keywords for that one uh, and everything else, don't touch it. And then Prodabrit is a good gameplay. So in this third level of model maturity model, it's all about publishing. And some ideas around it is you will have more database repositories. That's maybe it's still one, but I think you will have a pro, uh, 
the minimum typical approach is you have a dev environment, you have a test, it should not be text, it should be test environment, it should be production environment, or you structure it per project, per solution, by, by enterprise architecture, or you have a local repository, a global repository. Um, some people try to have only one repository that's called also makes sense, but you have also different aspects um, that you want to share. You have to deal somehow with versions, with maybe variants, and uh, there are different approaches uh, built in an enterprise architect, around enterprise architect. So I think that one of the great stories with enterprise architect that you can do quite a lot of things around and with enterprise architect, even if it's not built in, you can use that capability. I really appreciate that. Um, you have um, maybe to introduce new roles. So this is not in the list, but here you see, you will have in your organization persons that are model experts. They have experience. They know how to customize enterprise architect. They know how to develop an MDG technology. They do scripting. They 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 can do things that automates the the calculation of tech values. Um, they do model checking with model expert as an example. That's a tool. Therefore, it's a duplicate name. Uh, um, then there are model citizens. They're just doing what they have to do. So maybe they are just business process modelers, and they know I, I'm allowed to go there, I, dare, I will change the model. And then we have a huge number of people that just want to see what is their daily job, what is my process, what I have to perform. And so we have at least three different roles uh, with Enterprise Architect. And um, for publishing, we have some versions um, or variants. Variant one is that what I typically like for presentations. Hey, cool. I do the modeling and enterprise architect in the same model is published in the immediate, immediately in ProLaborate. You see what I model in ProLaborate in the same time because you have one repository, it's live access. That's nice. I think a lot of people uh, perform it like that. They don't want to have headache with multiple repositories. It's a, it's, it's a fine approach. Um, others um, are just copying. It's like, okay, ah, to, be, uh, to avoid that, especially for enterprise architecture management, if you do uh, a merge acquisition operation, so you purchase another company and you decide how to change the management, then it could be challenging if you, if you allow that everybody sees what you are currently planning, because then everybody can see that he as manager is already fired. So something like that if you go in the enterprise architecture domain. In the model-based systems engineering, the similar issue. If you change your interface for future and it's and it's 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 not staged, it's not kind of stable, then you see the changes instead of what is currently active. And then a lot of people started just copying the entire repository during a nightly build or nightly session. I have one customer, he's working in development with SQL Server, and for production, it must be Oracle. <laughs> Strategic decision. Uh, what it does is just making XMI import export, or I think it's really a database copy. I'm not sure, but it does it, it does it because um, he does want, don't want to care and he does database operations, whatever. They, they make a copy, and then a specific day, this is the new version. Um, then others are using scripts and say, okay, I just want to publish a part of my model, only everything that is approved, uh, only that everything that is a stable ecosystem. Um, what we have seen already before is some of them have kind of a deploy and merge process already. This is very often in, in, in regulated market uh, using auto elementary automation is also a possibility. So we have more possibilities how to say, okay, this is now a staging scenario that is for the public audience, and this is for the model for the developer audience. So we have more possibilities. So the different roles, of course, use ProLaborate, and there are two purposes to use ProLaborate. The first one, maybe the first one that's here, it's the second one. The, set, the first one is uh, to, cooperate, to collaborate also with the modelers. So of course, in Enterprise Architect, um, there's a nice feature uh, to have uh, discussions, to have review process, and so on. Uh, but in nowadays world, there is a lot of integration into a Jira ecosystem in DevOps. So there are tools around Enterprise Architect, and I really like this ProLaborate capability uh, to also review and discuss using ProLaborate in the team um, of the modelers. So there is a repository that is shared for the modelers, 
And then there is a publishing process uh, uh, where the models agree, okay, now we have a, a model and we are ready to publish. And there is a publishing process that kind of copies the database into an ecosystem that is then visible for all the others that are not part of the modeling team. So just to give you some ideas, could be very different, just uh, there, that therefore I named it ideas, could be very different in your ecosystem, but some ideas here. What I think is also key is not to do only modeling, think more about automation. What can I automate? What is this boring, stupid things you redo daily base? Um, we have a great implementation um, in in in, um, in Belgium. It's Lapnov. Maybe you have heard about that framework. Uh, it's very big and powerful and addresses a lot of things. But the key is not the MDG. It's also great that they have an MDG. But the key there is a lot of automation, a lot of thoughts that are already built in. Um, and this is where our partners are working on. Uh, or Reframe Avant, it's another partner. Uh, providing automation based on a specific structure, based on already thought thoughts for risk management for insurance companies and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, in a collaboration or publishing scenario, you also have to think about reusable assets. You publish a component. Um, another approach could be lemon tree components, but reusable asset service. There was a specific session today um, about this feature that is also coming with ProCloud Server uh, that allows that you have kind of versioned parts and pieces, packages, um, but you have to be clever not to have uh, conflicts and not too much cross package dependencies. Um, uh, this is what the reusable asset service provides. So how does this look like? Um, this looks like an enterprise architect, so I now come to my personal challenge uh, how to do a model with different stages um, but again um, here we have decided here there is a database and i said okay this database is for the modelers uh, under development you could say um, another approach could be that you have in the same model another root model but uh, this is just another approach and what you can also do you can create have another artifact the the public the published database Could be the same database server as I mentioned before. It could be others. Yeah. Um, so, and you can think about uh, having uh, a publishing process. So we will have kind of a component wherever it runs. Uh, a component typically on an application server. Um, this could be an application server using uh, OSLC interface, doing some automation. So uh, server-based PowerShell. Yeah. Whatever you use. I have seen so much already using Enterprise Architect, including uh, running things in the server. So it's uh, so we we as Sparks are really open-minded in whatever you want to use. You use the PowerShell and this PowerShell scripts, and I will not I will not do in a static architecture model a process. I have we have already developed a combination of uh, a static uh, model, including then the communication model. Here we need, would need now an, uh, an activity or workflow or whatever PPMN model, how to, to describe how the things are not playing together. But I explained it right now. You have a PowerShell script that goes to a, at a specific point in time using the OSLC interface to the database. There they grab a specific node and publish it to the other database. That's the easiest way. A lot of people, have um, implemented in Enterprise Architect, so we can do it right like that. They implemented an add-in to Enterprise Architect or just a script um, that does this operation. Or um, I don't want to mention here scriptlets because scripts is more live, but here it's an add-in. You perform that operation, you have a button like under specialized, you have a button where you uh, publish stuff. Uh, or do stuff operations um, in Enterprise Architect. It's also a possibility. Again, I don't visualize the workflow. And another story, lemon tree automation would be similar to the PowerShell. So maybe I write here lemon tree automation because I know it uh, personally very well. Um, and here is another alternative to perform that operations. Okay, um, so this is kind of bringing 
another dimensions into that. Another possibility is, of course, to have the scripts in a vertical versioning, uh, meaning you, you create the model root. This is another alternative. Uh, oops, I have to go to the model root to create a new model root uh, and name it publish. This is also maybe a clever idea somehow um, because this could be the node that is published to Prolaborate and then you have only one database. Um, it's, on, it's a magic question, but you can do a lot of stuff also within one repository. Um, the models I have in mind are having 30,000 or 300,000 model elements. And if you have then versions and models in the same, it could be complicated. But if you have a smaller model, 10,000 elements, 15,000 elements, maybe this is also a, a nice thinkable and accept a, a fine approach. Yeah? I think a lot of people do it like that. So this was what I want to mention for level three. But now it comes to another dimension. The next dimension is that you have to model, not because you need it or you do it for your day to day work. It's because a regulator or a state or a certification requires models. In this as samples, we have this ISO 262. There are others, they say 262642 for automotive, or we have this DO 187C for aviation and other standards that. Uh, and also for banking and insurances, especially in Europe, for GDPR, they say you need to have an enterprise architecture model. It's not enough. It's not enough uh, to have. Uh, it's not enough to have. That's a good question. <laughs> it's not enough to have a model. You have to have a version of the model. You have to have to go back in time and so on. And then we have a more complex ecosystem. And again, it's just scenarios. It could be a Git-based approach. It could be a version-controlled approach. But you have to think about um, that you, a model change is also triggered. And, not only, um, and no, you're not only the model anymore. You are in the in a, in a task around the model. So I think then you have to have a version-controlled backend. Uh, very popular for software is Git. I know that Git is for other domains like Nightmare, but uh, but in the software domain, systems engineering domain, it's very popular. I know also in the bank insurance for database architecture, for data architecture, sorry, it's also very popular to use it. Um, you need a very structured change management for the model itself. You have to keep historic stages, so not only the current version, the baseline, but to have the, the, the situation, the exact database from that time, you can make the copies of databases, uh, was the, in past uh, very often the only chance to achieve that. And uh, because you need it for any evidence in the future, as example for a court process, if a person was injured by the autonomous AI driven vehicle, you have to provide the model from that point in time that must be sealed. And this is kind of a different story if you go to regulation. Time is going by. Um, short story um, is I have currently identified four level of maturity. I think there is another, it's a level five, is optimizing. to so identify what we can do better is the same as with CMMI level that you optimize your process, that you have more automation, that you have um, verification of that was what is in the model. If the people do the right things, uh, get notified and not only a big peer groups, but notifications automatically. And I also think this is a, a nice approach. And think, have in mind, where is your organization at the moment? Where are you? Are you here with a central database? Are you already thinking about publishing? Are you in a regulated environment? Or as I, as a person, I do very often that stuff, but I have to, I see a lot of customers in that world. So everything is, um, has, its, has its right to exist. And uh, yes, you are not alone. Please share your thoughts. I'm happy to answer your questions in the Teams session. Hey, it's on time. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> so we have uh, some questions on the chat. Uh, so uh, do you know some of uh, some DevOps conferences or books that uh, combine uh, DevOps with models? Or do you have any recommendations for that? 
I will write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen so far. Um, I have borrowed a lot of ideas from uh, DevOps, and because DevOps, the term DevOps is since 2009, I think, and there's a new term called DevSecOps because uh, models are also becoming not only for systems and software, it's becoming also for security important. And there, the interesting story is if you are, have only developers in mind, I think it's not enough. You have, as, a, as I also identified, hey, it would I, I really would appreciate that enterprise architects is used by more developers. In reality, it's used by architects. And developers do not care about models. In, as a matter of fact, they still are coders and hackers. And I think you can so get so much benefit, but I have learned to deal, hey, we have to find the people who are architects and who are aware about the maturity and who are aware about how to deal with a with group of people and not with a person who wants to generate code. So I really like that idea to generate things automatically and therefore DevOps is for me an okay term. Uh, as a fun fact, in the last session I, mo I posted, we should name it mod ops, meaning model and operations, how to bring a model into operation. Um, uh, but I think um, we will definitely, I will um, bring out a white paper by mid of October, describing a little bit more what we have learned the last five years as Spark services um, from our customers and what they do and what they want to achieve. Maybe there are some white papers in between um, just to share our, food, our thoughts, um, to include this modeling as a part of the entire uh, workflow in your organization. So including the V model, including HL aspects, it will be a small book because I want to make it useful. Uh, but um, yes, there, I, have not seen, um, I have not seen a DevOps conference with models so far. And I think I like to be pioneer. Yes, and I think I am. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, the detailed explanation. Yeah, and uh, there's one more. Uh, is there any way to export the discussions? For, um, from what? From EA. I believe so. Um, I, I think the challenge is uh, in uh, that there is a, a minimum a minimal challenge uh, because I think um, the Pro Elaborate is is kind of an extension in the past and now it's part of our ecosystems. And um, the current is issue with the discussions is that there is a built-in functionality and there is the Pro Elaborate functionality. And if you start nowadays, I would definitely recommend to use the Pro Elaborate capabilities because it's it's a web based it's 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 writing it's sending email notifications because not everybody in the world is having enterprise architect open all the time as i have i have all the time enterprise architect open but maybe not all repositories i have and if the discussion is only within one repository then i would have to open that repository that i get um in, informed and therefore the proliferate way to have cross repositories notifications is that way that fits more to my personal uh, collaboration way. So discussions, I would go for discussions for Prolaborate. Um, oh, the only issue I see there, uh, the integration of the Prolaborate discussion into Enterprise Architect, there is a plugin, uh, but it's a little bit outdated. So if you discuss, stay in Prolaborate. And um, I'm not sure, maybe you can answer. <laughs> uh, if you can export the discussion from Prolaborate, I'm not sure. Yeah, we, we will take that, uh, Peter. As a feature request, yes, that's easy. <laughs> a good answer. All right, so I think since we are running out of time, uh, I'll ask the participants to post the queries in the Teams channel. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, thanks, Peter, thanks for your time. And uh, thanks for taking us through the various dimension of dimensions of modeling. Uh, but, uh, you know, with so much patience, you did it perfectly well. And, uh, you know, walking us through the live model, it was, it was perfect. And, uh, you know, to achieve, uh, I mean, this will also help us, I mean, help the organizations achieve the best result out of why do, why do they started with modeling. And uh, so thanks. Thanks for the same. Uh, thanks for the participants uh, for, you know, for uh, spending your uh, evening uh, with us, you know. I uh, hope it was very informative and uh, it gave uh, deeper insight uh, into the modeling uh, maturity topic. Uh, Peter and his team will be available in the Microsoft team uh, to have a detailed uh, discussion and to answer more questions. Uh, you could you could use the Teams uh, 
channel so i have pasted the channel uh, link in the chat window and uh, if you still have any issues in accessing the team's channel i could write to uh, the email uh, which is again uh, pasted in the chat which is registrations at uh, eaglobalsummit.com uh, thanks once again everyone uh, looking forward to hosting you in another wonderful session uh, thanks peter bye bye bye